Sam, I'd like to start off with what got you interested in covering the opiate epidemic? Yes, I, I came, I kind of back, backed into this story. Um, my initial interest was in covering Mexican drug traffickers. I was working on a team of reporters at the LA Times at the time, and my job was to cover drug trafficking of drugs after they crossed the border within the United States. And I began to realize that heroin all of a sudden was making a comeback, and I couldn't explain this. I didn't know what, how this would be possible. I thought heroin was kind of passe. I last remember it, it being popular in the 70s. And yet here were heroin traffickers doing this banner business, and it was in the course of investigating why that would be that I came to understand that we had created a large new market of opiate addicts, eventually heroin addicts, because of a, a major change in, in U.S. medicine, a revolution, I think, really, in U.S. medicine and pain treatment in the United States, which, which held that pain was at, at epidemic levels in the country and it was best treated with a, a narcotic or opiate painkillers of famously known uh, these days, today as you know, Vicodin, Percocet, and of course Oxy, OxyContin. But it was really because of my Mexico connection. I lived in Mexico for 10 years, written two books about Mexico, and, it was, and I was covering Mexican drug trafficking that I came to understand that wh why is it such a good day to be a heroin dealer in America, a heroin trafficker in America? Uh, well, it's because of, of the, the, the massive, uh, I think, overprescribing of, of pain pills all across the, the country, which kind of are the gateway now to, to heroin addiction. With your experience in Mexico, what led you to base the book on Portsmouth, Ohio? Well, as I got into this story, I began to realize that there were several lines to it. One was the Mexican drug trafficking thing. The first, though, was this revolution in, in, in American pain management. And um, one of the extreme aberrations or outgrowths of all this, of that pain revolution, was the pill mill. That's a doctor who perhaps starts, starts out fairly ethically and thinking he's doing the right thing. And eventually, I think what happens in many cases, uh, doctors just get their morals and their ethics just worn away by the insistent pressure from patients. I need these drugs. You've got, you know, and and um, so the pain pill mill or the, the, the classic pill mill that we've thought of, of just like a doctor prescribing these drugs like candy with lines out the door and people dressed in their pajamas, not caring what they look like, coming from counties all across or even states far away. Um, I thought that that was, that occurred to me then to be part of the story, uh, an important part, uh, one that I had not had any knowledge of uh, before I got into this story. I had no, I lived in California where we did have some pill mills, but they were few and far between. And so I figured, well, where can I go to study the phenomenon or know, know the story uh, of the pill mill? And of course, really, it was Portsmouth, Ohio, and the region within, say, a 50 to 100 mile radius around Portsmouth, Ohio. But the first doctor who started that model was a guy named David Proctor. He hires a bunch of kind of very, fairly unscrupulous doctors to run his clinic for him after a bit, and they go out, and they, it's like a franchising system almost. They all learn the business, they start their own pill mills, and at this point, uh, this all takes place though within the, within, the, within the context of American medicine saying we are in an epidemic of pain and we've got to treat it and these are the, the, the tools, these pills are the tools with which to treat the pain. Well, the ground zero for this epidemic seems to be West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio. Is part of the reason because of the prevalence of the pill mills in those areas? <sighs> I mean, I think that's a part, a, a symptom of what's going on. I would, I would put ground zero to be Cincinnati to the west, Columbus to the north, eastern Kentucky, and a very large chunk of West Virginia. That whole very rough area is, is pretty much it. And if you look in those areas, you find a, a lot of, of, of economic problems, a lot of people already relying on on government uh, 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 safety nets, whatever so the, uh, to whatever extent they could, uh, SSI, SSDI. You get lots of doctors in those areas already kind of disposed to be prescribing lots of drugs uh, and, and to be kind of fudging with the rules because they've got all these patients who are coming to them 
Sometimes it's for pain, but a lot of times it's for a life strategy. I lost my job in the mine or something like this. And uh, what can you, can you get me onto workers comp? Can you get me onto SSDI or SSI? Anything to kind of cushion, cushion the economic blow that the whole region is suffering. And I, and I believe that the first pharmaceutical promotions were in the, those areas because they recognized, pharmaceutical companies, particularly Purdue Pharma, recognized that there were a lot of doctors prescribing a lot of pills just in general. They were ready to prescribe those pills. And so that is a big part of why that area that I just described, I think, became the first where it, to, to be tenderized in, in this area and the first where you began to see widespread switching from pain pills to then heroin. And this was long ago. This is the, we've seen it in the last few years. It's been accelerating dramatically. But I, I, was, I was meeting addicts who had transitioned in 1998, 1999, 2000 who are doing this already. This is not like like something really new it's been going on it's just been recognized and the numbers have really accelerated in the last in the last few years but the pill mills were kind of like the the, the extreme aberration uh, really the pill mills are a minor part of the story more a, a far bigger part of the story is that every doctor in america it seems or many many doctors in america accepted the idea that we had an epidemic of pain and crucially most important that, that the way to treat it was with massive doses of opiate pain pills because they were convinced uh, now by pharmaceutical companies and certain pain specialists that these pills were now virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain, and that has proven to be not true. You discussed the pill mills and the opiate addictions. How does the opiate addiction seem to lead into the heroin addiction? Well, these are both based on, uh, these are drugs that are based on kind of the, op the, the morphine molecule. The molecule that you find in morphine is, is the same molecule you'll find in heroin and, and, and these, other, these other pills with some slight variation, but the, 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 the effect on the brain, the euphoria, the, brain chemi the effect on brain chemistry and the withdrawals, all of those are the same as if the, it was heroin. There, there's, no, there's very little difference. And so when a, 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 a person could be a recreational abuser, or could be a, um, a patient, uh, becomes addicted and for whatever reason uh, no longer has access to those pills or the pills become very expensive or frequently what I've found is they simply begin to search for a, 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 a bigger high, a greater, greater high. Um, they then begin to abuse those, they begin to smoke them. Uh, it's no longer just taking the pills. They begin to then uh, inject them and uh, liquefy and inject them. This was very possible with, with, particularly with OxyContin. OxyContin was a game changer because it allowed for that very easily, whereas like Vicodin and Percocet didn't. Um, once you cross that barrier of injecting, uh, you know, these pills on the street are very expensive, dollar a milligram, and you're using two, three, two, three hundred dollars, a hundred milligrams a, a, a day, that's a lot of money. Heroin, because it's all coming from Mexico and Latin America now, is much cheaper than it's ever been. And it provided like the low cost alternative for opiate addicts. And that's why people change. They, they, the, 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 the money's too much and they're already injecting frequently the pills. Uh, they, their addiction has moved beyond simply taking the pills to abusing the pills. And when that happens, it seems like a quote, no brainer to, to switch to heroin. That's how I've had it explained to me by many people. I read where you talked about how this epidemic has really gone under the radar in some ways. What do we need to do to make this uh, more obvious to more people? Um, I think that's that silence or the, the quiet nature with which this thing spread for 15 years is slowly coming to an end, thankfully. I think it's, it's, uh, it's something that has, um, in the last year, I think I'm hearing a whole lot more people talk about it than, than, than ever before. I still think, however, there is not a more judicious and nuanced approach to prescribing these pills. Still, way too many doctors prescribe these pills in huge amounts. You can now get 60 Vicodin or have for many years for getting when you get your tooth, uh, wisdom teeth with, with, 
with Ron. Um, uh, basic surgery, I had uh, my appendix out, they gave me 60 Vicodin. There's, I don't believe there's that need for that many. Um, I think most doctors would, would agree, honestly. I'm not a doctor, I'm a layman, but I would think most doctors would agree. But I think that, that uh, a nuanced approach to, a pro, uh, to prescribing these, ratcheting back significantly on that kind of prescribing and really taking more time with chronic pain patients who are also um, in so, some of them in need of these, these pills to understand what else can be done besides simply massive dosing of, uh, 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 of patients. You know, there's, there's, there's um, a, a lot of nuance that needs to be applied that before it was like a one size fit, fits all. Everybody gets the pills. Uh, for whatever problem they might have, and they get a lot of them because we believed, science believed, medicine believed, that uh, these were virtually non-addictive. That was the buzz phrase, you know? So um, I think a change in that approach, uh, a more of a, 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 an attempt to understand pain, to study pain more deeply, to understand the varying approaches that you might take not that these pills are not necessary, they are. They, they provide a medical, a, a legitimate medical tool to doctors, and that's very important. And pe some people need them, and, and most people need them post-surgery. You need them for a little bit. You don't probably need 60 to take home with you for, for an appendix uh, operation or a wisdom tooth withdrawal, you know. So it's these kinds of changes that have been part of medicine now for 20 years that have led, crucially, this is, this is the crucial thing here. We, we argue about what creates drug problems in America. Um, demand or supply? Well, I used to believe demand was crucial in all this, and, and it's a nuanced topic. There's no one answer, but in this case, it has most definitely been supply. And I've gone back and studied kind of other drug problems. The cocaine problem, we didn't really have a demand for cocaine until the Colombians began shoveling tons of cocaine uh, up through Miami and eventually up through 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 Mexico, so I've come to have a belief in supply as being the the instigator, the detonator, you might say, of the, of these problems. And certainly in this case, supply is key. That's why the behavior of doctors is crucial in 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 this epidemic. And and changing that behavior is is essential. You can't do anything without it. Doesn't seem to me. You've discussed supply from the pill standpoint. Could you discuss supply from the heroin standpoint? Sure. Um, that's very important, too, in all this, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, for, for a lot of years, through the most of the last century, um, the, the lion's share of our heroin came from the east, from Turkey, from uh, Burma, uh, to a certain degree from Afghanistan. I think most of it was like Turkey, those, the, that area. Um, that changed. Uh, Mexico was always has been growing the opium poppy for many years since at least the the, the early years of the last century, uh, and some of the of our heroin was coming from there throughout the last century. But really, in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, all of that eastern heroin uh, from Turkey and Burma and wherever uh, just stops, and really the 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 product is controlled by the Mexican and the the, the Colombian drug cartels and drug trafficking. Group. So almost all our heroin comes from there. That means it's all, uh, by definition, cheaper because it comes from not eight to 10,000 miles away, but uh, 1,500 to 2,000 miles away. And it's a commodity. Heroin is a commodity and it obeys, its cost is reflective of distance traveled for the product to get to, to, to market. What that means is a couple of things. First of all, heroin is now cheaper than ever. So it provides that low cost alternative to the pills. On the other hand, it's also more prevalent because it's so close. And there, that is why two things are, are happening. One is the heroin is more potent because it changes hands less. It's less uh, um, uh, uh, diluted by the time it gets here. It's therefore more, more dangerous. And that's why I think for many years, the, guy, the folks who got addicted in the 1970s kind of stayed alive because they were using fairly cheap, fairly diluted heroin. Now people are dying much more quickly because the heroin is just more, more potent. And when you get out you, there's of, say, jail or of rehab and you relapse, there's far greater chance that you will make a mistake because you don't know how much is in it. Before, the heroin was pretty, pretty stepped on, as they say, and, and it's, it's not, it wasn't very powerful. It's also so prevalent it's very, very difficult to 
get away from when, if you want to kick. And so it's always in your face. It's always around the corner. It's always got a friend's got it. Or it's, it the, the quantities of heroin available today, are, I think, are probably unprecedented in the history of our country. It's just so much in people's faces that it makes it very difficult to get a, a, some distance, some s breathing space from it, and a, therefore very difficult to kick. All of that makes it part of a huge part of the story. Then how do you stop the supply of heroin? Well, I think, uh, I, I think law enforcement has a huge role in that. But first, you got to stop creating more addicts. That is where the demand is important. Yeah, supply started this for sure. But now uh, we've got to understand that we control the supply. Legitimate medicine controls the supply of this. So. Uh, what I believe they need to do is really rethink how many, uh, and some places are doing this, so it's tr this, is, this is beginning to happen, but how many pills do you need to give a patient after uh, uh, um, a wisdom tooth extraction? You know, how do you really need to give them 60? What's gonna happen with all those pills? Best circumstances, they'll throw them away. They'll pay for them and throw them away. The worst circumstances, that those will leak out as they have by the millions into the recreational or the black market. You know, so I think the first thing is stop creating so many addicts. That is the first thing, and without that, it's very hard to imagine what law enforcement can do. It to me feels like being a law enforcement narcotics officer, say, uh, fighting this problem. <laughs> It feels to me like standing in the ocean trying to keep back the tide. There's so many people getting addicted all around you and they will eventually become heroin addicts. You know. Well, you heard that Governor Matt Bevan of Kentucky mentioned your book in a State of the Commonwealth address, mm -hmm. Dreamland. What does it mean to you to have your book mentioned and the recognition of the problem from that area? Well. Uh, I was stunned when the governor mentioned the book. I got about four or five Facebook pings, you know, that within five, 10, 15 minutes of, uh, of it happening. And, and my wife and I were kind of walking around in a daze in our home in Los Angeles. Um, it's a huge, huge thing. I mean, it, it, it also is important. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful recognition, and I, I, I'd like to thank him deeply for, for, for doing that. Um, it also is very important because it's a governor and the governor controls policy to a great degree. And so um, the book was written really to say this is happening in our country and no one's talking about it. You know, when I first was starting this book, I'll tell you, people looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why would you write about heroin? What? That was like the 1970s, wasn't it? I mean, what, what are you doing? Wasting your time about that. And I said, no, I think this is going to be a huge, huge problem. It's already percolating, just no one's talking about it. It's going to get even bigger. This was my response, kind of having faith that I was right, not really knowing. And so, I mean, I'm sad to say, honestly, that I've been proven right. But I think it's very gratifying that the book has sparked this kind of recognition, conversation. No longer is it swept under the rug or hidden from view. Pe families, I'm very happy to say, are now becoming far more vocal. That, is, that was huge. I'm a newspaper reporter for many years. I remember the crack days when uh, families in neighborhoods afflicted by crack would grab me, would talk to me, Dad, what, we got to do something, write about this. You know, this was a big public thing. The heroin epidemic has not been. It's been private. It's been quiet. And so, so the book was written with, with one goal of the book was to just say, this is happening. Let's talk about this. Let's get this out, out there. And the fact that a governor of a major state would say that uh, in his budget address, it just, I was stunned, honestly. I was like, Walking, really walking into walls at home going, I don't believe this, you know? I mean, I dream, would have dreamed of it, but never thought that would happen. You said something about how you had these other moments doing research for other stories. Is there a moment that sticks out for you while you were doing research for this one? Yeah, well, many, but one in particular, and this is uh, how I like to end, the, I, I ended the book. I discovered in Portsmouth, Ohio, a town that's been beaten down by the deindustrialization. It's a Rust Belt town. A lot of people have left. The people who remain behind a lot of times are infected with a kind of a fatalism and an inertia and that kind of thing. I discovered this story of this t uh, in, in the town of Portsmouth where they had the last remnants of their shoe industry. 
was a shoelace manufacturer called Mitchell Lace, which in, the, in its day was the largest shoelace manufacturer in America. It was about to close in 2009. It had been a variety of uh, ownership decisions uh, went bad and uh, it ended up in, in receivership. This was a crucial, pivotal moment for the town of Portsmouth that had suffered so much with depletion of its, uh, of its uh, economic base and, and uh, the departure of so many people in this kind of battered town. Had it lost its shoelace manufacturer, it's almost like, like psychically or in a soul way, it would have lost its soul in a sense, you know? And, and what happened was a few people from that town, people who knew nothing about shoelaces, banded together, small businessmen, a lawyer, insurance contractor, people like that, and they bought this shoelace, historic shoelace manufacturer out of receivership, hired the managers, who were the, apparently the people who actually knew it, how to run the place, not the owners, put them in charge, and that, that, um, that story or that, 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 that company is now like tripled its employee base. It's now exporting shoelaces to Taiwan, to Mexico, Italy, places like this. It's this magnificent story. And the reason that that is connected to heroin, I think, is because it was a way the town finally said we're done with dependency dogma of letting other people tell us that what, what we should be doing and, and this, we're gonna take control of our own destiny. And we're not going to just allow stuff to happen like a like an addict kind of oh well fatalistic uh, no there's no hope unless it's with dope you know um, this was a beautiful moment and I believe it presaged the beginning of a recovery movement in that town that is really fascinating to behold now you've got a whole bunch of people in. In, uh, in Portsmouth in recovery. You got a really expanded com recovery community, lots of 12-step meetings all over. Crucially, this was all connected to a, um, the, the law they passed in Ohio regulating pill mills. So they closed all those nasty pill mills and all of a sudden that supply went away. And again, this is what I'm saying. You take away the supply and people have distance and they have space to recover in really, really important. But beyond that, it was this idea like we can take control. We've been giving up relinquishing c control to people who believe that America was a, was a service, a financial services country and that um, all those manufacturing, dirty manufacturing jobs belonged in Malaysia or some damn place. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. And the story of Mitchell Ace, which is now called Soul Choice, terrific company, uh, kind of, I think, was the beginning of, of that. It's like this recognition that we didn't have to like just sit around and say, woe is us, oh, nothing we can do, everyone's leaving, we're nothing, we're worthless. No, the town said, you know what, this, if we do something, if we act, um, it's, it's what we can do. And that, I believe that that kind of detonated, I would say, a, a, a resurgence or, or, or a new kind of recovery movement in that town that I believe place, a place to go to see what to do about this problem is uh, Portsmouth, Ohio. Okay. Well, Sam, if you would tell everybody your name and the title of your book so they can hear it. Yes, my name is Sam Quinones. Uh, I'm an author and journalist, and my new book is called Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. All right. Sam, thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you.